Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, and thank you, that's Sebastian, for the presentation. Uh, so you focus on the environmental impact. I will focus more on the social impact of uh, the fashion industry. What I'm working on, this talk is about uh, designing a size inclusive fashion assortments, mostly in online environments. I will go through each of these, what is size inclusivity, what is special about um, fashion retailing and why we emphasize on the online aspect of it. So please stop me at any point if there's any question and uh, because I like to move a lot. If you cannot hear me, just let me know. So let's begin with a little bit of background. The fashion industry is, can you? Okay, let's click see. on the, just on the screen. Oh, I'm mouse. cool. Yeah. Oh yeah, thank you so much. So a little bit of background, the fashion, online fashion industry is the largest E2, B2C uh, E market in the world with $820 billion market value. And this number is for 2023, probably it's larger this year. And uh, it is among the few in industries that was positively affected by COVID-19, probably because people had nothing else to do other than shopping online and returning. I don't know. And uh, a lot of retailers do not have a physical store like Boohoo and ASOS. And uh, some of them have a very limited physical appearance like Gymshark and Shane. But like any industries, there are some issues that are endemic and specific to fashion industry. One of them is size and availability. And even before I said the name, you know we all, we've, all, we've all have experienced size and availability. We enter a store, be it online or in person, you like something, but it's not available in our size. This is called size and availability. And size and availability can be consequential. According to Belinda Earl, the former MNS style director, it can lead to a, not just a lost sale, but also a lost customer because of the frustration, because of the discouragement that uh, follows a size and availability. However, here is the catch. Not all customer experience the same level of size and availability. So this figure shows, uh, shows the size availability in different sizes for 10 of the top UK women's wear retailers. What we observe here is there is some sort of a pattern for sizes 14 and above, which are called plus sizes. So not just one retailer, almost all of them have less size availability for sizes 14 and above for plus size people. But at the same time, they follow a re really good level of availability for other sizes. And it is the same thing that we observe in our data set. So in collaboration with a large European fashion retailer, what we observe is that, um, for example, in one category, despite the fact that sizes large and 2X large have the same fraction of customer, 16% of customers are in each of these size, size unavailability is more than twice for size 2X large. It's not a good thing. In fact, it is called a subtle form of social discrimination. Why? Two customers, same willingness to pay, same preferences, enter the same store and can have a vastly different shopping experience. Why? Just because one of them is a plus size person and the other one is not. So that's the issue that we want to tackle here. We ask ourselves two questions. First, how can we incorporate this size and availability issue into customer choice model and into retailers problem? And second, um, how can we design a static assortment optimizing alg algorithms that find assortments which are profitable yet size inclusive? So in this slide, I will first go through some, um, uh, I will go locate our uh, question, our research question in the literature. Then I'll go through some definitions. I will develop this, uh, the choice model that we used here, then the objective function which penalizes for the uh, for unfairness in an assortment. Then our solution approaches, one exact, one approximate, and some simulation results. So our research is located at the intersection of two major lines of research. One of them is assortment optimization, and the other one is fair operations, and they have recently gained momentum, especially fair operations. And we can see the fair assortment optimization, there is a recent interest in this line of research but these questions, fair operations and fair assortment optimization, first, they are mostly concerned about size, uh, about price fairness. And 
these questions, they focus on a platform problem. For example, Amazon wants to make sure that different sellers have a fair chance of showing their products. It's not from customer side of thing, it's from the platform side of thing. But our question is from the customer and fairness among different customer groups, not price fairness, but availability fairness. So just some quick definitions. We introduce an option to be a specific sewing pattern in a specific color, and an option can be available in different sizes. Each of them is called an SKU. And depending on the sizing system, which we show with G, this can be available in different sizes. For example, if we have a four sizing system, small, medium, large, and large, they can be available in each of them. So in this, um, in this research, we say that there are N distinct options in the inventory and B distinct option SKU pays pairs in the inventory. For example, for this inventory, there are four distinct options and 12 distinct SKU pairs available in the inventory. And because our problem is a static sort of optimization problem, we don't care how many of them are available. We just care if an SKU is available in the, in the inventory or not. So that was from the inventory side of thing. From the website side of thing, what we have control over is the set of distinct options to show. We show it in bold X. And for each option, we introduce configuration to be the set of distinct sizes in which that option is available, or the SKUs of that option it is, which is available on the website. We show it with C, CJ, and the set of all these configuration for all the options available on, on the website together, we show it with bold S, bold S, bold C, sorry, bold S and bold C together construct our assortment. Yes? Um, why is the configuration different than the inventory? Amazing. So we may decide not to show an option to some customers. Okay. We can. We may, we may not. Uh, yeah. We may decide not to show it in some sizes. Um, but do you assume that it's a retailer that has brick and mortar and online? So oh, no, maybe no. the inventory is shared, or it's just no, no. It's just a, for a single uh, retailer, for a single online retailer. We will have we, we have an extension for brick and mortar, but we are assuming just one inventory related to just one store. But yeah, great question. So configuration and available uh, items can be different. So it may have it on the inventory, but not show it. So uh, from that question, let's uh, go through some uh, another two other phenomena. One of them is broken assortment. This is from the inventory side of things. So we say that an assortment is broken when a size is not available in the inventory. What we call Having an item in having a size in the inventory but not showing it, we call it concealment. Okay. So we talked about the um, definitions. Let's go through the uh, choice model. So for the, to develop the choice model, we begin with customer journey. A customer in size group I. Let's say I am a size group medium. I usually wear size medium. Somebody size group small, and so on and so forth. They enter the store. Uh, first, they click on the category web page, the category from which they want to buy something. Then they open the category web page. What they see is basically the option assortment is S, is capital S. According to an MNL choice model, they choose the option that gives them the highest utility. And uh, they can leave the store as well. Um, after that, they enter the option web page, and now they see the configuration for that option, in which sizes that option is available. Knowing their size and seeing the configuration, they will choose the option, they will choose the best fit size, or they may not choose anything. Okay, so we show it with FICJ. So fraction FICJ of customers in size group I after seeing configuration J, configuration CJ, we'll purchase an item. Okay. So there are five possibilities for FICJ. If a customer in size group I enters the store and the option is available in her size, amazing. FICJ would be equal to one, all of them will purchase. If not, there are four other possibilities. If not, some of them may decide to go and buy one size larger. Fraction 
PU of them, if it's not available in that size and one size larger, some of them will go and buy one size smaller. If not available in this size, by two neighboring sizes, PL plus PU of them will go and buy. If none of them, none of them is available, neither in the focal size nor uh, the neighboring sizes, none of them will buy it. So that's how we, find, we define FICJ. So going back to the revenue, what would be the expected revenue from showing an assortment? Um, it depends on which customer size group we are talking about. So first we multiply it by uh, CI, which shows the fraction of customers in size group I, multiplied by the expected revenue from customers in size group I. Uh, and for the expected revenue, we multiply it by FICJ because we said fraction FICJ of them after saying this item will purchase it. So here we make a, um, yeah, we make an assumption here, which is a valid assumption in the fashion industry context, that customers of different size group have the same preferences over the options. So two different customers from two different size groups have the same preferences we applied here. So instead of having VIJ, for all of them we have VJ, and this would be the format that we have for the revenue. It resembles the classic um, MNL revenue maximization problem with a small twist, which is now we have modified revenue. So revenue is modified here in the sense that um, depending on how big KCI is, FICJ becomes important. So that's how size availability is important for the, in, for the revenue side of things. And it also shows what are the dangers of using a utilitarian view toward marginalized size groups. So people with the smaller KCI, size availability for them is less important. So this was from the revenue side of things. What about the fairness side of things? Um, for that, we focus on the customer experience. We said, what is size availability? What is size and availability? I enter a store, I like something that's not available in my size. I will capture it here. I will capture the probability that this thing happens for size of, for a customer in size group I. So it's like the customer in size group I enters the store, they like option J, but with probability one minus F, FICJ, they will not buy this item because of size and availability. So together, the probability that this thing happens for a customer in size group I, we show it with UI given assortment SC would be this. So Let's go through an example. Let's say we showed an assortment to a series of customers. What would be their um, experience, their shopping experience? So I showed this assortment to the customers. Customers in size, size group S, amazing. Everything is available in their size, no dissatisfaction. Customer in size group M is really bad because none of them is available in their size. They have to either substitute with other sizes or just leave the store. For sizes large and X large, it is okay. I mean, one of them is unavailable, but yeah, two others are available. So the metric that we introduce for capturing the unfairness given an assortment is a pairwise, or what is called a distributive uh, fairness metric. So we focus, we introduce the gap between the best and worst customer experience because of size and availability as our unfairness metric. Okay, so is there any question until now? Um, uh, sure. So that's blue means utility? Oh, no, no, good question. I'm sorry, there are tons of uh, issues, of, like notation issues here, I accept. No, uh, U here means size and availability. Oh, so yeah. this like a proportion for the customer empty-handed? Yes, that's the probability that the customer leaves the store empty-handed because it was not available in their size. And thank you for the question. So with that, we introduce the objective function to be, so we introduce profit to be revenue minus lambda, which shows the price or the importance of eradicating unfairness multiplied by unfairness. So this is the objective function that now we want to maximize. Uh, let's see what happens in an ideal case. The ideal case is if there is no broken assortment, Every option that you like, every option that you see, 
is available in every size in the inventory. In that case, we first prove that concealment is not optimal. So everything that you have, you should, if you are showing something, if you are showing an option, you should show it in every size. So if, that, if that's the case, there is no unfairness in the optimal, optimal assortment. And in the optimal assortment, FICJ for every size group, for every option would be equal to one. Putting this together, in that case, when there is no broken assortment, you should simply solve the classic MNL uh, revenue uh, maximization problem, which we know the answer to it. It's been known for 20 years. We know it has a nested revenue order structure. So that's really cool. The issue, however, is that a non-broken assortment is a pie in the sky. It never happens. So we have to do something about it. So we, we adjust our objective function. We make two adjustments on our objective function. First, uh, working with max over two size groups inside the objective function is a bit complex. So we replace it with its a linearized version. We introduce this uh, gamma xy's to show the importance put on the gap between the unavailability of the x and group y. As such, we will have, if there are g size groups, we will have g to the power of two gamma xy variables. And let's say in the optimal assortment, the largest gap is between group m and x large, gamma m and x large would be equal to one. So that was the first thing that we did. The second thing shows why we focus on online retailers. So unlike brick and mortar retailers, online, online retailers are not limited to showing just one assortment. The most tangible example being uh, Netflix or Amazon. What I see on Amazon is completely different from what you see on Amazon because of our different history or anything. So, Online retailers are not limited to showing just one assortment. With that, what we use here is randomization. We said there are B SKUs, B distinct SKUs in the inventory, so there are two to the power of B feasible assortments. Instead of focusing only on just one assortment, we will focus, we will introduce a probability of displaying each of these two to the power of B assortments. This is called, we call it randomization. So depending on your background, you, might, you may have heard about randomization in ex-ante fairness, in game theory, in online adversarial learning, and recently in randomization, uh, in a paper in the assortment optimization, in robust optimization. So randomization is widely used. Yes. Yes. question. You define this unfairness yeah. as the maximum uh, difference between uh, two different kind of sizes. Yes. Size groups, right? Yeah. But you don't use any like a size distribution in this metric. Did you? Oh uh, no. So no, you, don't, you don't look at the size distribution, like how many people are yeah. this class, uh, mm -hmm. medium, and so on, so forth. Exactly. One version of it would be you can weight this unfairness based on the size distribution as well. Mm -hmm. Like if there are like guys who are maybe one percent in the population, you may not pay attention to those mm -hmm. type of <laughs> issues, right? So what's your take on this? Um, I would say that's a very utilitarian point of view. That's that, and that actually the, <laughs> that's actually the root cause of this issue because okay. similarly, because when we are waiting based on customer size group, necessarily we will kind of ignore what happens to those marginalized groups in favor of those in mainstream groups. Mm -hmm. So yes, of course, here we can also do that, like a bit modifying this and putting like CI, but the issue would be we will not solve the issue, like the issue will remain here. Yeah. So, but how do you tie this to the fact that a normal retailer will purchase on the, the based on the distribution of sizes, right? They that, don't, they're mm -hmm. not gonna buy a uniform number of, no, no. of, of, of all the sizes. That's absolutely correct, um, yeah. And then add to that like minimum order quantities and all that stuff, right? So, yeah, yeah. So what's your take then on, on this, that necessarily, mm -hmm. practically, right? This is great, this is really good theoretical work, but practically you, you wouldn't have to and I want to say discriminate because it's already very negative, right? <laughs> but you, the, the, the business of fashion does not allow you to 
have that because then you'll have a lot mm -hmm. of, of of leftover inventory for sizes that are that's absolutely correct. And that's what we are working on our next research project. Here we are talking about a static assortment optimization problem. So we are saying that the inventory is given at this moment what we can do. What you're saying is absolutely correct for the mid and long term things to talk to the to the retailers, to producers, to what we can do together. That's true. So, so your question is today, what assortment should I show my customers? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Today, given an inventory, the static problem. Yeah. How you many were in the middle of like <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you cannot uh, go back, so yeah. replenish order and so yeah. Because yeah. how many people? Because I know this is something that came up a lot in the review process for our first paper. Um. Because people think, and you also gave this example when they think of online retailers, their mind will go to Amazon. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Amazon is quite sophisticated. How sophisticated are other fashion retailers? And I'm thinking, because I know I've been to H&M, their level of sophistication is actually pretty low. <laughs> very low. <laughs> Zara also. It's a bit better, but it's still very low. Yeah, yeah. right? And those are the two big ones. I don't know about Shein. I don't know about Timu. I mm -hmm. think they're a bit closer to Amazon. Mm -hmm. Um, so you're focusing really on those kind of tech-based retailers. Uh, we are focusing on, I would say, uh, Zara and H&M type of things when they want to start doing something. So here, the issue, yeah. the problem that we have here is that, so depending on the PCI, so the problem changes. So the Amazon and Shane and things that have a history of, of your purchases and things like that, they actually know PCI. They basically know your size. Mm -hmm. But we are talking about a general retailer who they want to just design their size agnostic option web page. But that's a, that's a really good question. So the mm -hmm. moment the retailer knows something about you, the problem changes. No, because okay. also, like, I don't think that the... Um... Assortment is that dynamic also for Zara and H&M. And it's more like they decide on the what they show based on just if they have new releases and not. That can be. And we will show that um, something similar to what you showed in your paper, that it is possible to be profitable with a marginal, like just a small yeah. dent on the profit, but be more way more size inclusive. But what you are right, there are Lots of other things. We're focusing on this aspect. In a static setting, yeah, yeah. the next thing would be to consider this. You're building the foundation. Yeah. Oh, good. So, yeah. We introduced our objective function. We said uh, randomization. So with randomization, what we have is we have expected revenue, which is the probability of showing it, an assortment multiplied by its revenue, and expected unavailability. And all these together with the expected revenue minus the gap between expected unavailabilities. But the question is, how would randomization help? Let's go through an example. Suppose there are only two size groups, size X and size Y. And there are only two possible assortments. Assortment number one with revenue 10, which is unfair toward size groups in size Y. And assortment number two with revenue 8, which is unfair towards customers in size group X. And we put the importance or the price of unfairness to be four. We introduce P to show the probability of showing assortment number one. Okay, so we begin with P equal to one. Revenue is equal to 10. The unfairness would be equal to half multiplied by four. The total profit would be equal to eight. We said P equal to zero. Revenue is equal to eight. Unfairness is equal to half multiplied by four. Profit is equal to six. But let's say we set P equal to zero, 0 0.5. First, they are dimmer. It's a cool animation to show like you know, mm -hmm. we are showing the probability 0 0.5. Then here's the magic. Together, when we set P equal to 0 0.5, we are eliminating the systematic discrimination. So based on a customer's chance, if they're lucky, the assortment is fair toward them, unfair toward the other group. If they're un unlucky, it would be unlike unfair toward them. But in general, 
the probability of being unfair now is equal to zero. That's how randomization helps us. So basically, that you are screwing people. <laughs> 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 That's the one way to put I received this comment from one of my presentations, by the way, I just want to show me that comment. <laughs> That's one way to look at the problem. So uh, we do some reformulations. We bring out this gamma because it's, an, uh, it's a simplex. We can bring it out. What we have is this amazing max mean structure that we really love. And let's say just first focus on this part. This part is expected profit if we only focus on the gap between group X and Y. Okay, so that's it. Then multiply it by the uh, emphasis put on the gap between groups X and Y. We have this max minus structure. So we say the retailer is the maximizer and an adversary, which we call nature, is a minimizer. And this resembles a strictly competitive game. Uh, we go one step further but, and introduce nature's utility to be minus one multiplied by retailer's profit. So we have this payoff matrices and A alpha beta is when nature focuses on row alpha, focusing on the gap alpha, and retailer shows assortment beta. So that's element alpha beta of this matrix. Now the retailer's problem is this to maximize this gamma transpose AP. Uh, it's good news, so we have to maximize this, but the issue is that um, we, we cannot do it so simply because A is so huge, it has, yeah, it has G to the power of two rows, but it has two to the power of B columns. We cannot even store it in a computer. We need to do something, but here what we have is if we set gamma, we know what is the optimal P. We know the single assortment that maximizes gamma transpose AP. And this is what we call the retailer's best response oracle. And yeah, that emoji is why I said I have to show it on my laptop. So with this, uh, one thing that we know is that in zero sum games, the max mean, the min max, and Nash equilibria all have the same value of the game. So we will we begin with pure Nash equilibria. We say and nature plays pure strategy if he only focuses on one gap, and retailer plays a pure strategy if he only shows one assortment, it's probably equal to one. Because the number of uh, nature's uh, pure strategy is limited, is g to the power of two, we can check each of them and see if a pure Nash equilibrium exists. And uh, why are we so obsessed with Nash equilibrium? The answer is uh, twofold. First, if a Nash equilibrium exists, first, it's the exact solution. We found the optimal solution. We don't need to do anything else anymore. And second, it's easier to implement in practice. Yes, we said retailer, online retailers can randomize, but still it's easier to tell a retailer to just show one assortment instead of saying like just randomize all of them. Okay, but um, again, sometimes we are not lucky and the pure Nash equilibrium does not exist. By sometimes I mean usually when lambda is large, which means we really want to reduce the unfairness um, and that a pure Nash equilibrium doesn't exist. But we do not need to worry about it because for a finite zero-sum game, there exists a mixed Nash equilibrium. And we will find it either through an exact sol solution, the ellipsoid method, or an approximation, approximated solution, or through the uh, multiplicative weight update method. So before that, let's just rewrite our problem. Our problem was max mean. So we write nature's dual here. What we have is maximizing V such that each of these Vs is less than or equal what I said. This is the expected profit if we only focus on the gap between group X and Y. Okay, so that's the cool part. There are only G to the power of two uh, constraints. The issue begins here. We have two to the power of B feasible assortments. So which means we are two, there are two to the power of B decision variables. This is awful. But there is someone, or there is a method on this planet that really loves this situation. This is the ellipsoid method. So we are saying the decision variables, they're exponentially many decision variables, but constraints are limited. They're only g to the power of two constraints. And 
we have the best response oracle, which works as the separation oracle in ellipsoid method. So if we give it to the ellipsoid method, we will find the optimal solution. That's good news, but the, uh, the sad part of it is that nobody uses the ellipsoid method. It's super slow, it's super clunky. Yes, it is polynomial time, so the problem is not MP hard, but nobody implements it. We need to do better than that. What we do is we go after an approximation solution. So the issue with the LP, the original LP, was that we had two to the power B decision variables. We can reduce it. What we do is we use the multiplicative weight update method. I will talk about it. Uh, we give it the problem setup and the best response oracle. It limits our candidate, candidate assortments to T, which is an order of one over epsilon to the power of two epsilon is the our approximation guarantee. Then we can run this LP on that. So what is the multiplicative weight update uh, algorithm? It has roots in adversarial online learning because uh, we, did not, we do not have our own framework. I will not go to the details. We just adopted another framework. But just a quick thing, quick review. An additive approximation algorithm, unlike a multi multiplicative uh, approximation algorithm, which we are used to, what it, had, what it does is that the gap, V star minus V, is what we found, V star is the optimal solution, is less than what we call an epsilon. So we are used to this V star less than equal one minus epsilon multiplied by something, but here we have this format. It's an additive, okay? So going back, what happens here is we have two to the power of B feasible assortments. Not a good idea. We feed it to the MWU. MWU does its magic and gives us T assortment and tells us if you choose from these T assortments, if you run the LP on these T assortments, you have the approximation guarantee. Amazing. So what we do is we feed it to LP, and LP gives us the approximate optimal solution with at most g to the power of two distinct assortments to be shown at random. Now that's something that I can sell to a retailer. Uh, we call this thing together the augmented multiplicative weight update, AMW. Okay, so what are the results? First, we now have the approximation guarantee that we look for. Second, it's just an LP on top of MWU, so it's still quite fast. And third, there are at most g to the power of two distinct assortments. Now I can say tell the retailer to show these among these g two g to the power of two distinct assortments assign the probability. Yes. What's g again? G is the number of size groups. So if there are six size groups, it is 36. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, so it's I, a I, small, no, no, but I was just trying to get the, the, the magnitude. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, so it's, it's, it's not that many. It's not that many. And thank you for the question, because in practice, in our simulation, it's actually around two or three. It's not, it doesn't even reach 36. It's like two or three assortments. So speaking of uh, uh, simulations, let's go through some simulations that we did. First, what is the simulation result? We set n to be equal to 100, so n distinct options. And g, we set it equal to 6, x is small to 2x large. That was the setup that we worked with. So from the data set that we had, we estimated p1 and pl to be equal to 0 0.25. And uh, from that data set, we estimated distribution of PCI, VJs, and RJs, so the fraction of customer in each size group, the valuation distribution for different options, and the revenue of each option. And their correlation. Okay. So, Arisa, how many um, distinct uh, option SKU gave us? Uh, uh, six hundred at most. At most. At most six hundred. Yes. Right? Okay. Mm -hmm. And with that, we, yep. Um, how can? How did you define the twenty-five percent with oh. PU and PL? Uh, we estimated it. So we oh. used uh, the DID approach introduced by Lee et al. Twenty twenty-three. Uh, if we have time, I will go through that. It's actually okay. a really cool idea. Yeah, we estimated it, so it's not something that we assign. And with this, we divide data generating functions to create data sets that resemble the real world data so we can repeat the simulations. Before that, let's just generate one data set and see what happens as, as we increase lambda. So for one data set, we created, uh, we found the optimal assortment with different levels of lambda. 
Okay, so lambda equal to zero means we only maximize revenue. Then as lambda grows, it means we really care about the unfairness. So the worst of group is the 2x large, and the best of group is the small, because we are talking about unavailability, so the, the less, the better. As lambda increases, what happens is, yes, the unavailability for size x, x large decreases, but unavailability for other groups also increase. That's uh, what happens when we use a pairwise metric. So it's not just dropping this, but also using concealment to increase this. Okay. But, so if I'm a retailer mm -hmm. and I look at this, yeah. I'm worse off caring about it because if there's XXL, that's a very small segment. Yeah. If I start caring about fairness, I'm worse off on any other sizes except XL. If you use a pairwise metric, which people use in practice, in real world, what people, people do is that they have reference sizes. So they say, okay, why when I enter a store and my friend in size medium enters the store, they compare themselves with their friends. If you use that, yes, that's one of the issues that, ha that happens. But the good news is you don't need to set lambda to be equal to this thing to see miracles. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for different setups, for different lambdas, for different epsilon PUs and PL, what we did is we ran the simulation once with lambda equal to zero, which means we only care about revenue. And once with lambda not equal to zero, lambda equal to let's say 0 0.5, 0 0.25, and things like that. Mm -hmm. What we observe is, so comparing the two, the revenue, we would observe a decrease in revenue, right? Because we are not optimizing revenue anymore, we are optimizing the profit. The good news is, with just 1.5% drop in the revenue, we can drop on fairness by 30%. So it is doable. Yes, I cannot tell a retailer to set lambda equal to 0 0.25 and lose 6% of its revenue. They would um, have really bad words. But uh, with really small drop in the revenue, I can drop the unfairness by 30%. That's the good news. And another one, because I talked uh, about the approximation. So for these things, we set epsilon to be equal to 10 or 20. For an additive approximation algorithm, epsilon equal to 10 means if the optimal solution, let's say, if the optimal uh, value is 36, we are OK with values of 26 or 30. But what we observe is the gap between the upper bound for the profit and what the AMW algorithm finds is around 0 0.15. We are pretty close to the optimal solution with a large epsilon. So for good approximation, we do not even need to set epsilon to be equal to 0 0.1. If epsilon is equal to 0, equal to 10, we had good approximations. Okay. So I will also talk about one uh, extension, which is like the brick and mortar stores. They cannot do this randomization. They are like, yeah, just give me one assortment. If a pure Nash equilibrium does not exist, because if it exists, the solution is solved. If it does exist, it does not exist, we can uh, we can modify the LP, make it an MIP by saying that okay, just show one assortment instead of showing like giving me a distribution. The uh, probability would be equal to zero or one, which means only one assortment. The issue is that it's an MIP. We do not have a performance guarantee, but in practice, it works great. So if we do that, we show it with MIP, MIP gap, which is the gap between the upper bound to the profit with randomization. And the solution that we found showing only one assortment is around 0 0.2, okay? So it shows that we can do it and we can implement it in practical, like in, in practice and for the brick and mortar stores as well. So what we did in this research, we, we, we modeled the, uh, profitable yet size inclusive problem. We transformed it into a zero sum game. Then we introduced some approximation and exact solutions. And we calibrated our model with real data and ran a series of simulations. What we found from simulations is that first, we can have huge drops in the unfairness with just a small dent on the revenue. Second, we can be really fast by choosing large epsilons. And third, 
they are practical. We can use them in brick and mortar uh, stores as well. So thank you so much. And uh, if there's any question, I'd be appreciated.